Okay, so in this video I'm going to talk to you about the last aspect of SHM, it's called circular motion. So first of all, circular motion isn't something people recognise straight away as an example of SHM. So, let's first remind ourselves what SHM means. It's when acceleration is directly proportional to the displacement, but in the opposite direction. So it's directed towards the equilibrium position. So, first of all, when something's travelling in a circle, where is the equilibrium position? Well, we think of this object here going round on the board. So the circle is in the plane of the board, so it's going around like this. The equilibrium position is going to be the centre of the circle. That's where it's going to want to go if we have a, like a tension force or a string pulling it inwards. It's always going to try and move it to the centre. So that's our equilibrium position. Um, so what we're going to do is actually split it up into the x and y direction. So y going up this way, x going across this way. So if the string has length L, and I'm going to call this angle here theta, the angle to the y direction, and so this angle is also going to be theta, we can see this one is L cosine theta, this one is L sine theta. Those are those distances. Okay, so... That's what we've got there, so that's our basic setup. So let's continue on with this. So we're going to look at as if this is a horizontal. So imagine we're looking down on this whole setup, and we're going to focus specifically on the circular motion. So we're not going to think about the gravity for now, that would actually be pulling it sort of into the board. We're just going to focus on the forces in the plane of the board. So we're looking down on something in circular motion. And what we need to do is work out what tension we would require in the string to make this work. So from the previous slide, we've got essentially some expressions for cosine and sine theta. And what we're going to do is work out what the resultant force of these two is. So we've got to split it up into t cosine theta and t sine theta, just like we did before. So the resultant force in the y direction is t cosine theta, which is going to be t over l times the displacement in the y direction. Likewise, the resultant force in the x direction is just going to be the t sine theta, or t over l times the displacement in the x direction there, using these relationships up here. And again, we're, not, we're ignoring the weight force which is going to act into the board for now, we're only interested in forces in the plane of the board. So we can see here that the force in the y direction and the force in the x direction are both directly proportional to their just respective displacements there. So that's working as an example of SHM. Okay, so that's going to work, we can see here, as long as these two things remain constant. So the force of tension and the distance L. So that's one of the reasons we need the force to be constant it magnitude in SHM there, so that relationship holds. So now we've got that, we can then work out what the resultant force is, if we know the resultant force is in the Fy and Fx, so we can square them and add them together, so Fx squared plus Fy squared, so we end up with T squared over L squared, that's just going to be a constant in both, X, Sx squared plus Sy squared, and when we put that together, this is just going to be S squared, so this whole thing becomes T over L, S. So resultant force is directly proportional to the displacement as long as T and L don't change, or the magnitudes of T and L don't change, um, which is great. So we got, that's one of our conditions of circular motion. Okay, so what do we mean by uniform circular motion? So to be in circular motion, the resultant force must always be directed towards the center. Okay, That's one of the conditions, and it needs to have fixed magnitude for some of the reasons we just talked about. That's one of the reasons you need it to have fixed magnitude. There are other things to think about as well with that. And if you have a condition where the resultant force is directed towards the center of a circle, that's known as a centripetal force. So we haven't invented some new kind of force here, this is just another name for a resultant force that happens to be directed towards the center of a circle. The other thing to be in uniform circular motion is the speed must stay the same. So not the velocity, the speed of it, the magnitude of the velocity stays the same. Because the direction we know as it goes around the circle, the direction of its motion is going to change. And so if we have those two things, um, then 
we know we're going to be in circular motion, and actually we also know we're going to be accelerating towards the centre of the circle. So if you've got a resultant force towards the centre of the circle, you're going to be accelerating towards the centre of your circle. Okay, so what we've got here is like, you what, mate? Speed is constant, but it's accelerating. That doesn't make any sense. And in terms of what you've seen before in mechanics, it doesn't make any sense. You're like, uh, what? Until you remember that velocity is a vector quantity. So it's not just the magnitude that's the important, the direction is also important. So even if the magnitude of velocity stays the same the whole time, if its direction is changing, that velocity is changing, therefore it is accelerating. So let's have a look at a few different things. So again, same example as before, I've just labelled a few different regions and indicated the direction of the velocity at those points. And if we focus on C and D here. So at C, the velocity is directed in what we called the X direction earlier. At D, it's in the Y direction. So it essentially must have experienced something to get rid of this component in the x direction and something else to give it its component in the y direction. So the change in velocity it must have experienced is this way, which we can see is directed towards the centre of the circle, which is always reassuring. So we've got the change in velocity towards the centre, which means the acceleration must be towards the centre of the circle. So it is in fact accelerating in that direction which is good because that's what we just had. Okay, so we've got that it's accelerating towards the centre and from that we essentially know that the resultant force must be directed towards the centre because that's using Newton's second law there. So we can actually not even start knowing which direction the resultant force is and conclude that the resultant force is towards the centre which is nice. And then just a little thing in here when we apply Newton's third law, when something applies the force inwards, so if I'm making this circle, I'm going to be applying the tension force inwards, what the Newton's third law says is I, the thing creating circular motion by like winding it around, will experience an outward force because of that. So the object, the one you can see going around here, does not experience an outward force. It experiences an inward force at all points. But me at the centre of the circle, I'm experiencing a resultant force radially outwards in the circle there. And would obviously need something like friction to stop me moving. Okay, so that's where Newton's third law slots in. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is introduce you to some rotational properties of motion. So, so far in all of the stuff on circular motion, we've looked at it in terms of linear or straight line motion. It becomes much easier if we switch into a rotational uh, mode when we're dealing with circular motion. So I'm going to introduce you to that now. So the first one is angular displacement. So as an object moves around a circle, what you can do is measure its displacement in terms of the angle it's displaced, so like this one here. And typically you would do that in radians, and uh, once you get into circular motion you'll see why. So that's displacement. And we also have angular speed, which is the rate of change of angular displacement. So essentially, how many radians per second the object is travelling at. And the last one, angular acceleration, is the rate of change of angular speed. Um, again, so you can see it's very similar to displacement, velocity and acceleration in linear motion. It's the same process of taking the derivative each time there. Okay, so... Those are the properties that you'll look at, and mostly you'll just use these two. You're not going to come across angular acceleration, because in uniform circular motion, it's not its speed around the circle, or its angular speed stays the same, so you're not really going to consider this. So what we need to do is figure out how we can convert between linear motion and rotational or angular motion. So you should know from maths that if you want to find the length of an arc, what you do is you multiply the radius of your circle by the angle in radians. So what we can do is get the linear displacement, let's call it x, is equal to r times the angular displacement. We can do the same in terms of angular speed. So to go to linear speed, let's call it v, from angular speed, we multiply the angular speed by r. So we get this equation, v equals r omega there. And you'd actually find the same process to go from linear acceleration to 
angular acceleration, again, you multiply angular acceleration by r. So they're just connected by the radius of your circle. Uh, to introduce a couple more properties to do with circular motion, we just like SHM with springs or pendulum, we have a time period, which is the time it takes to do one complete circle around. And likewise, we have an angular frequency, so the number of cycles that it does per second there. So both of those fit with circular motion as well. And we can work out the time period in terms of linear motion by doing the total distance, 2 pi r, divided by the linear velocity, or we can do it in terms of the number of radians, so 2 pi divided by omega. Again, either of those two things would give you the time period. Okay, so that's that. So let's derive the equation of circular motion. So there's a, a set equation for centripetal acceleration and centripetal force. So let's see where that comes from. So we're going to start by looking at an object. So to start with, it's travelling in this direction, so it's like at the bottom of your circle. And then a short period of time later, it's going to have moved around the circle, so its velocity is now going to be angled this way. And we're saying it's moved around the circle by a very small angle called d theta. So if you want to know the change in velocity, it'll be the vector that joins these two. So this is how you go from here to here. This is the change in velocity. But we also know the magnitude of the velocity stays the same. So we know these two sides are equal. So what we're looking at is a section of a circle where these two are radii there. And you can see that arc drawn there. So the key to getting to the equation is this assumption we're making, that this angle, d theta, is really small. And if it's really small, the black line and this green dashed line are basically the same length. So the arc length is equal to dv. And we know the arc length is going to be the magnitude of the velocity, I'm going to call that v, multiplied by d theta. And we get this expression here, so delta v is v d theta. So acceleration is rate of change of velocity. Uh, change in velocity is v d theta. The time taken to make this change will be this, the angle change divided by the angular speed. That should give you the time for this change. And when you do that, you end up with v omega because the d thetas cancel each other out. So we know v is equal to r omega, so we get a is equal to r omega squared. And we know omega is v over r, so we can get a is v squared over r. So these are your equations of centripetal acceleration or the acceleration towards the centre of your circle. Using Newton's second law, we then get these two expressions for the force required to make an object go in circular motion if it has this mass, this velocity, and it's this far from the centre of the circle. So we can work out what force is required in different scenarios. Okay, so the last thing we're going to look at is an example of how we can put this into practice. So a lot of the time when you meet circular motion, you'll meet it with magnetic fields or with gravitational fields, that kind of thing. In this example, I'm not going to assume you've seen those topics, so we're going to look at something that's just purely mechanical based. And we're going to look at a car driving over a bridge, and we're going to model the bridge as being like a semicircle with radius r. So what we're going to know is how fast can we drive over the bridge before we lose contact with the ground. So I'm going to say it's travelling at the top of the bridge, it's travelling with horizontal velocity v. So First, we need to work out what the resultant force is toward, on the object towards the center. So the force acting towards the center is its weight force, but then there's going to be a reaction force the opposite direction. So the resultant force is going to be given by mg minus r. If it's going in circular motion, that must be equal to mv squared over r. If it's about to lose contact with the ground, r becomes zero. So if you're not in contact with something, there can't be a reaction force. So r is zero. Your m's cancel, and you can calculate the maximum velocity with which you can travel over a bridge with a radius r there. There are other examples like cars going round bends where you can go through a similar process, equate the resultant force to the centripetal force equation, and again go through a similar kind of process. Okay, so that completes this video on circular motion, and in fact the series on um, simple harmonic motion. I hope you found those useful to help explain these topics. If there's anything you're not sure about or you'd like explained further, please do comment and ask me any questions. Um, but thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video.